in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 through, 4, excuse me, 1 through 13, the earth experiences calamity, the beginning of the trumpet judgments. If you will, stand for the reading of the word of God. We honor God by standing when we read his word. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it into the, into the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, and lightnings, and earthquakes. So the seven angels who had seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up. All the green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown to the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that the third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels were, who are about to sound. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you always give warnings before you act in judgment. To the nation of Israel, you sent prophet after prophet. To us, you have given us your word to give us a heads up. And may we be mindful of what we see in our times happening today as push towards globalism, that sort of thing, that this is a prelude to all of this stuff happening. Help us to be alert. Help us to be ready. Help us to be active for you until you come for us, either naturally by natural death or by the rapture of the church. And Lord, we all vote for the rapture, but Lord, it's your, it's your will. We thank you for this time to study your word. Open our eyes, Holy Spirit, to the truth of it. Please speak to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. The earth is going to experience calamity. Uh, remember, the theme is Jesus is coming, and he's coming in judgment. He's coming in judgment. Last week, we saw the 144,000. Jewish evangelists that were sealed and protected from the Antichrist. And they are so effective that there's a great harvest of souls during this worst time in the history of planet Earth. Jesus said there's nothing going to be like this in Matthew 24. That this is going to be just so awful, but these witnesses will be effective. And out of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people group, there's going to be a massive harvest of souls. Remember this, God loves people. God loves people, and he gives chance after chance after chance. He is long-suffering with humanity. In 2 Peter 3, 9, we get the heart of God. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And we went through last week that we are created in the image of God, the imago Dei, that we are created in such a way that we reflect God. And so that every single human on the earth has value and purpose and meaning. That we realize, and we went through some scriptures in, in Acts chapter 10, that God is not a face looker. He does not look at the outer. He looks at the heart. He's not a discriminator. He's not a persecutor. He's not, he's not prejudiced. He's not prejudiced. He is a God that loves mankind. As a matter of fact, the atonement was for all of humanity. In 1 John chapter 2, verse Verses 1 and 2, it says this, If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. But not only our sins, but the sins of the entire world. You know what that means? Jesus' atonement is available to every human. But it is efficacious or effective only for those who believe and receive the gift. So the universe, there's a universal atonement. Now some people will say this is universalism, where everyone eventually is saved, and that is no. How do we know that? Because Jesus says in John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. 
Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Now hear this. That word wrath is the word orge. O-R-G-E. And it means this. It means anger as a state of mind associated with grief. See, God does not willingly want to judge people. He does not willingly. He wants people to turn and live. There's another word in the Greek called thumos. This is what we get from time to time when you get that flare of anger and you want revenge. This isn't what this word is, that God, his wrath is not that way. This is a grievous thing to God to have to pour out his wrath on humanity. Now, this week, things just keep getting worse for the earth dwellers. The trumpet judgment starts and the worst the worst calamities that you can imagine are going to start to be perpetrated on the earth itself. See, Antichrist did a lot of bad things to the people on the earth in the seal judgments. But now these judgments are coming on the earth itself. In chapter 5, remember, Jesus was handed the scroll to planet earth. And in that scroll, there were seven seals that he would open up. And it would reveal what's going to happen, sequence step by step by step by step. And it would reveal all the horror that was going to be coming. The first four seals, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Remember the rider on the white horse is the Antichrist bringing a false peace. Remember, he ascends slowly to power. He just doesn't burst onto the scene and take over planet Earth. He ascends slowly to power, and then people start to love him, and he's going to be responsible for that peace peace treaty that gets signed in Daniel 9.27. He's going to be the lying peacer of the Earth. The second horse was the red horse. That was war. He'll, he'll go very soon into war and demand that everybody worship and serve him. That, what comes after war is the black horse, and that's famine, and that's death. And after, after, after famine comes the pale horse, excuse me, which is death. And we remember, we learned that one-fourth of planet Earth will die in the first four seals. One-fourth, and we calculated that as 1.7 billion people. This is going to be tragedy that is beyond our imaginations. The fifth seal we see under the altar, the the saints, and they're crying out, how long, O Lord, how long before you end this thing? And in the sixth seal, everyone knows by now, with all the cataclysmic events, all the cosmic events, the earthquakes, the the moon going dark, everything just falling apart, the, the sky receding as a scroll. I can't imagine what that whole thing is about. People then know, hey, that this whole thing has been the wrath of God. They know that it's the wrath of God. And then finally, the seventh seal is opened. And we know that in the seventh seal, the trumpet judgments get opened. And at the seventh trumpet, Jesus said, the king, or the script John says, is being told, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever. He's taking back planet earth particularly when it gets into those trumpet and bowl judgments. So things we need to know about the seventh seal. The seventh seal. Again, they're all the wrath of God. The seventh seal opens the seven trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet opens the bowl judgments. And the trumpet and bowl judgments are all contained in the seal. Or excuse me, in the scroll. So let's look at just a little scroll here. Everything is contained in this scroll. All of this is the wrath of God. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh seal. The seventh seal opens the trumpet and the bowl judgment. All that awful stuff is still contained in here. All of it is the wrath of God. Jesus taking over planet earth. At least that's the way that I see it. Again, there are people that disagree with me, but okay, they can disagree. Uh, Remember, the, the the, the scroll is a deed to planet earth. And that scroll is dealing with Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all the earth dwellers that have bought into Antichrist lies. And we know, again, that many of these earth dwellers will become heaven dwellers because of the witness of the 144,000. And there will be a violent extraction out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I've shared this verse several times, but in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says this, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. 
That word has delivered is the word rumai. Rumai means to draw with force, to being ripped out of Satan's hands and placed into the kingdom of light. There's an instant transfer of ownership. Now, please hear this. Every human that is born into planet Earth, every little nice little baby, they're born into the kingdom of darkness until they're rescued by Jesus Christ and brought into the kingdom of light. That is the truth. Now, some believe this, that the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments overlap. Okay? It's just a repeating of the same thing. This is called recapitulation or restating. Now, Andy Woods and his work had this picture. So we'll show you. This is recapitulation. They, they, they believe, many believe, that these are all the same judgments, just a different view of the same judgments. Now, I don't believe that. I believe they telescope. They telescope. So you're going to see the next one. So next one is this. I believe that they are, the seals are, are, are terrible. 1.7 billion die. The trumpets are awful. And we know in these trumpet judgments, there's going to be another third of the earth die. And the third and the one-fourth are going to be in half of planet earth die. And then this, the seventh uh, trumpet judgment opens the bold judgments. This is towards the very, very end. You know, some people think it's, you know, a month, weeks, just it's, this is very close to the end. I believe that after this, after the trumpet judgments, that salvation is no longer available to these folks. They've been totally given over. And you're going to see in Revelation chapter 15, verse 8, why I believe that in a few weeks or months or whenever we get to that. So, I believe they telescope. So verse 1 and 2, there's silence in heaven. Now, if you remember last time we met in chapter 7, there was all this praise and adoration that was going on before the throne of God as these 144,000 had this whole harvest of souls from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So we had the angels, we had the elders, we had everybody, the cherubim, they're all bowing and they're worshiping God and saying how glorious and wonderful he is. There's exuberance in heaven, but now something changes. Verse 1, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. This is John's perception of time while he's there. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Earl Palmer says this, it's the silence of mystery and intense waiting. There's communicated in a dramatic way the awesome authority of God. Everything must wait for the king to make his move. And they know that something is off the wall bad is going to happen. All of heaven seems to be aware of this catastrophe that's coming. And it's coming full speed ahead. Once this thing starts, nothing will stop it. Now think about this. The awful prospects of what is about to occur are felt by the angels. They're, they're feeling this tension. The saints or the elders that are in heaven, they're feeling this tension. The, 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 the whole heavenly realm, I think even the Godhead, they're, they're reluctantly, it's like, I, we're going to have to do this. But it's remember, God's wrath, it, that word orge, is not something he's joyful about. This is something that I think breaks the heart of God. The stark silence of the impending doom is right before our eyes here. It's like the silence before a storm. The target of the first four trumpet judgments is the earth itself. A decimation of what the earth dwellers worship. And you ever heard this? Mother Earth. Let's talk about Mother Earth for just a second. There's a sense today that Mother Earth is a living entity. A living entity. That hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, natural disasters are a reaction to Mother Earth being hurt by our insensitivity to the climate. And it's a result of climate change. Wildfires. Remember, just recently, Nancy Pelosi stated that Mother Earth is angry. It's permeating our culture. Younger people in particular, when they go to college, they're, they're really being bombarded with this. What we are seeing is this. They worship the creation 
rather than the Creator. Romans, Romans 1, 22 and 23. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now notice the Bible's not politically correct. It tells it like it is. They became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Now God calls this foolishness. They are fools. The word is moreno. The root word is moros, from where we get our word moron. And that is someone who is insipid, means dull, or a simpleton. The Mother Earth worshippers' cry is this. Now tell me if you have not heard this in your lifetime. Save the owl. Oh, save the seal. Off the coast, save the, do everything you can. Save the elk. Don't put that, that, that oil line in. Save the elk. Save every animal that you can. But most of those folks, they can't label them all, but most of them are save the animals on the earth. But what about the babies? What about the babies? It's the, the animals have precedence over the babies. Isn't that tragic? Talk about calling evil good and good evil. As it says in Isaiah chapter 5. It is amazing that people worship creation and ignore the creator. Worshiping the environment is called Gaia. There's an there's a environmental god. There's an earth god called Gaia. G-A-I-A. It's, it's from Greek mythology. and it, it, Gaia birthed Uranus, the planet, by whom she bore the titans, the mighty men of old. Our destiny is dependent on what we do for Gaia, the earth god, the environmental god. Taking care of the environment is something we should do, okay? We are to be good stewards of what God has given us, with everything, our homes, our, everything that God has given us, including the planet that he's given us to live on. But worshiping the environment is not a good thing. We're to be good stewards. Look at man will not destroy planet Earth. Now man will give it its best shot, but Jesus said, lest these days be cut short, no flesh would be saved alive. Jesus is going to make an intervention. I know that the earth will be preserved because of Psalm 104.5. You who laid the foundations of the earth so that they shall not be moved forever. Forever. That moved is to be carried away, to fall into decay, to slide or to slip away forever. God made this earth. And it will stay until God creates a new heaven and a new earth when we go into eternity. The idea that earth itself is the deity is mother earth worship and it's false god worship. Now, the problem with this is it's the wrong kind of thinking. In the tribulation period, the Antichrist will be promoting this. The earth dwellers will be worshiping earth. They will war against the true Christ. And God will hit them right in the heart, just like he hit the Egyptian gods. The ten, the ten plagues in Egypt was just like against each one of their gods. He's going to hit the earth god. Now the question I want to ask you is this. Are you feeling today a little sense of foreboding? Do you feel an impending doom in our world today? Do you see things changing a little bit or maybe a lot? Something is just not right in our world today. And I want to suggest to you, and I've made this statement before, that never in the history of our nation, you know, 1776 to today, has there been more of an abandoning of God. Never in our nation, all through those several hundred years, there was never a kicking of God out of the culture. But we are doing that today. And we're reaping the awful consequences of that. Just look at our streets. Look at our schools. Look at our country. It's terrible. Remember this. In judgment, God is getting people's attention. It's, 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 it's a last resort. Judgment is a last resort. Again, maybe remember, God sends prophets to warn. Several hundred years he warned Israel, and they didn't turn. We are being warned today. Think of the ten plagues in Egypt affecting the false gods. 
An act of mercy. Judgment is an act of mercy by God. How so? He's getting our attention. He's telling people, I am real. I am here. I am alive. Change your direction and repent. Again, do you sense something is terribly wrong in America? And I bet you do. I bet you do. And my cry and our cry, and our, Lord, please save this country. Turn America and live. Verses 3 through 5, you know, when you have a problem, what are you to do? Pray. Pray. God hears your prayers. Verse 3 through 5. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, symbol of prayer, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it to the earth, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. And it just gets worse for planet earth. It just, this is a prelude. This is, this, is, this is something. It's coming. It's coming. These trumpet judgments are coming. Look at In times of crisis, in times of calamity, in the good times, in the bad times, in the ugly times, pray. Pray. Now, look, at we want to turn to prayer immediately. We don't want prayer to be, well, let's punt to prayer. Oh, let's just punt to prayer. That's all we got left is prayer. We, that doesn't want to be our attitude. And remember, our prayers go before the altar of God. That's what it says here. How are we to pray? Well, I want to suggest you where to pray in the Spirit, Ephesians 6.18. Pray in the Spirit on some occasions. Thank you, thank you, that's right. On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert, always keep on praying for all the saints. How often do you pray? Always. That's our go-to position. In the Spirit is in line with the Holy Spirit. Thy will be done. In prayer we become one with God. We pray in this manner, guess what happens? 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says this, This is the confidence that we have in approaching him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we will have the request that we've asked of him. We're going to pray according to his will. Folks, prayer is not a last resort. Prayer is not a, oh, this is the, there's nothing else to do. Let's pray. No, prayer for the believer is our go-to position our go-to position, an immediate response. Here are the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. He says, be joyful always. How often are you supposed to be joyful? Always. Even in the calamities that we are seeing around us, be joyful always. And then do what? Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, how can you be joyful always? You can't unless you are dwelling in Christ. Now, I had a plan here. I was going to go to Psalm 37.4, which says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And I was going to take a few minutes to develop this, because that's a go-to psalm for a lot of people that want to get what they want. That delight means have your heart soft and pliable. Have your heart in line with what God wants. But because of time, I'm going to skip developing that. But if you were here on Tuesday night, you would have heard the development. Our prayers are a sweet aroma to God. We see that in Revelation 7, 3. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne of God. That's the altar of incense. The sweet aroma of your prayers goes up to the nostrils of God. God hears you. God hears you. Never forget your prayers matter. God loves to hear from you. And remember what prayer is? It's simply talking with God. So do so often. Now, what are hindrances to prayer? You ever wonder why, oh, my prayers don't seem to make it through. Well, there's some hindrances to prayer. Think about this. Number one, if I have sin in my life that I'm not dealing with, God's not going to hear me. How do I know? Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. Secondly, we have to pray his will be done. This isn't something, that, it's just not go up to the tree and get whatever you want and, 
and take it for yourself. We are praying in his will. We already covered that in 1 John 5, 14. We are also also not to be self-centered. You have not because you you have not received not because you ask with wrong motives. James 4, 3. We must have a spirit of forgiveness. If we have an unforgiving heart, our sins will be blocked. Matthew 18, 23. A root of bitterness will grow up, grow up. And then finally, unbelief and doubt, a lack of faith. Matthew 13, 58. Remember, Jesus did not do many miracles in his hometown because they refused to believe him. And finally, for you husbands, if there's discord in the family, if you're not treating your wife properly, then that falls under 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands have the responsibility to treat their wives with loving kindness. And if they don't, their prayers are blocked. And by extension, it doesn't say this in, in Ephesians chapter 5, 22, where wives are to submit to their husbands. But I would say if they're not submitting to their husband who is loving her as Christ loved the church, then that woman would be in sin. That wife would be in sin. And her prayers would be blocked. So, pray always. Now, I want you to notice in verse 6, the angels are ready to go. Okay? This is like, hike, hand the ball to me, I am ready to go. Boom. Okay, I'm coming through the line. Verse 6. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. This has just developed an echo, so should I put this out a little bit? Okay. Okay. Oh, so, so the angels are ready to do God's bidding. They're poised. They're ready to go. Now, how does this speak to me? If we see the angelic realm poised and ready to go, how does this speak to me? Look, at when God speaks to me, and how does he speak to us primarily? Through his word. Through his word. He can also speak to us through the spirit. Okay? But I want you to remember this. The Holy Spirit, if you're going to claim that he's speaking to you, and I believe he does, it'll always be in line with the word of God. It'll never be contrary to the word. Okay? So that's something to remember. I must be ready to respond immediately. No procrastination, no churning about it. You know why I say this? Because when God speaks to you and wants you to do something, it's usually contrary to what you want to do. Oh Lord, send me to Hawaii. I know they need missionaries in Hawaii. Not Bangladesh, Lord. Hawaii. Look at He will send you where he needs you and where he wants you. You know what else will happen? If you obey him, he will give you a heart that will love what he wants you to do. It won't be easy. At first, it won't be easy to take that step. But oh, once you obey, you're going to receive blessings. That's something to remember. Verse 7, the first trumpet judgment. Vegetation is struck. Let's read it. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Now, a preface to these first three trumpet judgments. There are many people that believe in Midrash, and these are, are symbols or pictures of what's going to happen. It's not actually what happens. Uh, that these are probably demons and that sort of thing. Now, there's great scholars that look at it that way. I look at it more simply as that this is what's going to happen. Okay, so you must understand that you will hear from other places that type of teaching on this. Also, I want you to notice this. The seven trumpets are all going to hit planet, are, the first four deal with earth. The grass, the sea, the, the, the salt water, the sun, locusts, the 200 million in an hour. These, are, I believe, are demonic here. And then Jesus at the seventh trumpet, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of his Lord and Christ, and he shall reign forever. This is when Jesus is going to say, all done. And when you get to, to 11, chapter, excuse me, at the end of chapter 7, the seventh trumpet, which is in chapter 15, 8, you're going to see that after that, there's no more going to be saved. This seventh trumpet doesn't blow until the 16th chapter. 
He says it here. That trumpet goes off in the 16th chapter. At that point, I believe all the earth dwellers are confirmed in their disbelief of God. And there will not be any more saved. I think that's very close to the end of the tribulation. Could be months or even weeks. So, uh, with that stated, plant life is devastated. And and I I, I think that these are, this is something that's, you know, I think there's going to be hail. And I think it's going to be bad. Uh, Trees produce food. Remember, trees are also protection. They root in the ground. They stop erosion. uh, They protect from storms and flooding. Animal life will be affected by the loss of green grass. Human life will be affected. The globe will start to look like a virtual wasteland. Mass famine, people fighting for food just to survive. And again, look at what God is attacking. He is attacking Gaia, the earth dwellers God. The earth god. Fire mingled with blood. Remember the seventh plague in Egypt. A lot of these coincide with the Egyptian plagues. In Exodus 9.13 was hail. Folks, what did Pharaoh do? He hardened his heart. Now this is the seventh plague. You think if you... you how many times you... Just give me one more chance. Okay, dude, you've had seven, six chances. This is your seventh time and you still have hardened your heart. He is confirmed in his unbelief. What will the earth dwellers do? We know that in Revelation 9.20, they harden their hearts and refuse to turn. Second trumpet, verses 8 and 9. It just keeps getting worse. Okay? One third of the sea is destroyed. Then the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Can you imagine? Now, a meteor, a volcano, I don't know what in the world this is, but this is a disaster, a great mountain, and a third of the ocean is destroyed. A third of the living creatures in the ocean, a third of the ships are destroyed. This is another massive disaster. Think of the food impact with this. Think of the economic impact. And don't underestimate this. Think of the emotional impact. Look, at we see Katrina, and we're a mess. We see something disastrous, the fires out in California. It, it, it impact. Can you imagine something like this? Massive PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, will be in store for planet Earth. And still no repentance. In verse 10 and 11, the third trumpet, one third of the fresh water, and it just keeps getting worse. Thank you, worse. Verse 10, then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and in the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because it was made bitter. Now, notice that it's a star, We've known that stars have been uh, associated with angels as the, as the churches were the stars of the, in, in Revelation chapter 1. So Wormwood, some people postulate, is a demon entity. So that at least they have a little bit more to stand on there. So the great star fell from heaven. Again, that word star is aster, and it means asteroid. It's called Wormwood. It means bitter, and a third of the fresh water is, is destroyed. Now, drinking water is defiled. You know how much of your body is water? 60, 70% of your body. If you're a baby, it's 80 or 90%. We need water. You can live weeks without food, but days without water. God describes idolatry as a root-bearing bitterness of wormwood in Deuteronomy 29, 18. Now, how does God view idolatry in America? In the church, in my life, bitter, bitter, bitter. And what is an idol? Anything that you put above God. Anything that you start to worship. Anything that you try, that takes your attention away from from God and puts it on that idol. Some things are good. It can be your kids. It can be your family. It It can be exercise. Exercise can be good. Exercise can become an idol. It can be any number of things that you place above God. And you start to idolize and worship. You might not do it consciously, saying, I'm putting him above God. 
but you actually are, are working that out in your life. It could be bad things, money, power, position, fame, sex, self-idol of, 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 of myself. It can be good or it can be bad. And again, some believe that this, since this star refers to angels in Revelation 1.20, that Wormwood is a fallen angel. Again, when God judges, what is he doing? He's turning up the heat. Remember, each time it just gets worse. In hopes that more people turn, more people turn, more people turn and live. In hopes that mankind repents and turns to him. In the fourth trumpet judgment, the heavens are struck. And it just keeps getting worse. Verse 12, Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I don't know how you get a demon involved in this, but these are the luminaries in, the, in, the, in their environment, and these things are all darkened by a third. I mean, it has to be stunning. One third of the light of the sun, the moon, the stars will not reach earth. Don't know how it's going to happen. But remember years ago, there was a program called the Twilight Zone. Well, this would be the Twilight Zone. I mean, you saw that big orange, the orange sun with all the haze from the fire. Can you imagine this? There was a blackout in Egypt for three days in Exodus 10.21. And it says that it was a darkness that could be felt. And you know what what God was doing there? He was attacking their sun god, Ra. And in attacking the sun god, Ra, he's going to show you who the real God is. And it was a darkness that permeated all of Egypt. But Goshen, where the Jews were, was in the light. They were protected. The Egyptians experienced a darkness on the outside, but also in their dwellings there was no light. There was absolute darkness. Now, how do I know that? Because of what it says in the scripture. They did not rise from their place for three days. They couldn't move for three days. Abject darkness, outside, inside. Everybody's going, I can't. Totally blinded. Totally blinded. Now, this darkness must remind us of the darkness of hell awaiting all who reject the light of Jesus. Matthew 8, 12. But the sons of the kingdom, now this, if in context, this is speaking to unbelieving Israel, who have rejected Messiah, will be cast into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Think about this. If there's no Jesus, there is no light. With the light, with Jesus, the light of the world shines brightly. Remember what Jesus said in John 8, 12? In one of his I am statements, saying that he is the ego mi, he is God incarnate. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. What a contrast. Those who are saved, those who have believed and received the gift of salvation, will live forever in the light of the Lamb. Revelation 21, 23 the Lamb is the light in eternity. There will be no sun, there will be no moon, there will be no stars. The Lamb will be the light. Verse 13, woe to the, in- the inhabitants of the earth. It just keeps getting worse. Why? In the hopes that people will turn and live. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe. To the inhabitants of the earth. Can you imagine that sight? Let's just say this is written. It's saying exactly what's going to happen. An angel is going to be going all over the earth. Yelling to the plant, the earth dwellers. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because of the remaining blasts of the trumpets of the three angels. Who are about to sound. Now can you imagine how those earth dwellers would feel. After what they've experienced. And now this, this angel's going around saying. It's getting worse. You would think people would turn. You would think they would. First, the first four trumpet blasts are affecting nature. Three woes are direct attack on, on humans. The target of the woe judgments is the unbelievers, the earth dwellers. 
The first two are demonic, and the third one is when Jesus opens the bold judgments and he's taking back planet Earth. The earth dwellers know something, that these judgments are from God. Yet like Pharaoh, they refuse to repent. No one can see, say, that these angels are fly, this angels flying around, that it's not from God. It's not coincidence. God seals believers and he protects those, them from these judgments. But guess what? You too, the instant you believed, were sealed by the Holy Spirit at salvation for protection and his ownership. You are protected from the direct attacks of Satan and his demonic hordes. They cannot hurt you. Remember Job? He had this fence around. He had this hedge about, thank you, hedge about him. Couldn't get through. I picture that with us. He had to have a, a permission. We are protected from his direct attacks. Satan cannot hurt you directly. Remember that. He doesn't have that type of permission. He doesn't have that type of power. You are sealed. You are marked for protection. You are not, however, protected from Satan's schemes. Remember his methodologies, it says in Ephesians chapter 6, 11. His traps that he sets. Remember, he's an expert trapper. He knows the exact bait that you require to cause your fall. He's been watching you. The demonic realm has been watching you. They know exactly what it takes for you to stumble. He's an expert at this. We are to stand against the wiles, the schemes, the methodia of the enemy. His methods are time-tested on humans. Now, God has supplied us with protection from his schemes, the armor of God, but we have to walk in that. We have to walk in that. Ephesians 6, 12 through 13, we can't do the armor of God. Of course, it's not, we don't have time for that. But you know that you have armor that's available to you that we're to put on and keep on. Folks, it's up to you to live out your life armored up. Do not give the devil even a little bitty, teensy, weensy, teeny, tiny foothold. No foothold for that dude. Nothing. Ephesians 4, 27. Thank you. I couldn't read my head. I smear through it. Now, what gives the devil openings? What gives him a foothold? Just a couple things I thought of. The occult. If you dabble in the occult, you are opening the venues for satanic involvement. Drugs. Sex outside of marriage. Any kind of sex. I can't even describe them all because it's not appropriate right here, but something outside the bounds of marriage. Bitterness, wrath, a spirit of anger, theft, drifting from God, dabbling with the world system more and more and more, embracing a worldview that is contrary to God. You're opening yourself up for a, for a foothold to be made. Folks, today is the day of salvation. If you have not yet left the ranks of the earth dwellers, if you have not left the ranks of the earth dwellers, enjoying the citizenship of heaven, this is your day. Don't delay. For each day of delay provides further opportunity for you to harden your heart just like Pharaoh and just like the earth dwellers. Folks, there's a time when the Spirit of God comes. And he changes your heart. He softens your heart. He takes the blinders off. He says, I am here. I am here. Believe and receive the gift. But if you stiff arm God and stiff arm God and stiff arm God and stiff arm God, there is a time just like Pharaoh and just like will happen with the earth dwellers that God says, okay, you can have your way. And you'll be under the wrath of God. And it's, and it's grievous to God. Remember, you'll be under the orge of God. Today is the day of salvation. Closing, the earth experiences calamity. What is coming to planet earth, as you have heard, is of epic proportions. Jesus warns us that it'll be awful, worse than any time in the history of planet earth. Remember, we've covered this so many times. Matthew 24, 21, and 22. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world and this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved alive, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. We know that Antichrist carnage will cost one-fourth of the earth. 
We know that these trumpet judgments will take another third of the earth. That total is a half of planet earth. Four billion people killed. Tragic. When Jesus says no flesh shall be saved alive, it makes you think about uh, that he has to intervene on this in order to save the planet. Thankfully, Jesus will return. He will put down Antichrist rebellion. He will put down the false prophet and the earth dwellers. But it'll be one, the world will be one big giant mess. It'll have to be redone for the millennial reign. Our blessed hope, folks, is this. Our only hope in a world running from God is Jesus Messiah. Name above all names, Jesus Christ the Messiah. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world in John 1.29. The Lamb, the Savior, Jesus Christ, enters the calamity of earth and he brings peace with God and the peace of God. You want to have peace, it's the only way you're going to have it is with Christ. You can take all the drugs in the world you want. You can go all the meditation that you want. You can try all the world religions that you want to try, but the only thing that's going to bring you peace in this mess, is a relationship with the Savior. Our shepherd will lead us, folks, to still waters. He said he would. That's the calm of life. Even now, even now in our chaos, he can bring us to the calm. He can bring us to the still waters. Folks, Jesus is the antidote to the calamities in our life. You know, where is the lamb is the cry of Scripture. Where is the lamb in the Old Testament? In Genesis, Abel bought bought a lamb, a picture of Messiah to be sacrificed. In Exodus, the Passover lamb was sacrificed for each household, and the blood was applied to the lentil and the doorpost, a picture of Messiah. In Leviticus, people were instructed to sacrifice the lamb on the Day of Atonement for the nation, a picture of Messiah. Where is the lamb? You know what Abraham said? when he's going to sacrifice his son, and his son Isaac says, where is the lamb? And Isaac was going to be the sacrifice. You know what Abraham said? The Lord will provide. Always remember that. Jesus is our substitute. Behold the lamb is the hope of the New Testament. The hope for all humanity. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you believe and receive the gift of salvation, you can be, you will be saved. Transferred in the kingdom of God. Don't put this off. Aren't you sensing it? The time is short. The time is short. There's too much at stake to procrastinate. Do not be one who chooses calamity over the calm. Over the shepherd's still waters. Remember John 10, 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life. That they, and, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them or take them out of my hand. Folks, it's this simple. Calamity or calm. It's up to you. Father, thank you for this time that you've allowed us to study the word. The precious word of God. And even in these trumpet judgments that are so awful, we have hope. Thank you for this picture that even when you're pouring out your wrath, your orge, you're doing it with kind of a mind like just wishing they would turn. Your desire is that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Father, I pray today that if anybody is hearing this message that doesn't know you as their Savior, that they would take just a moment, examine themselves and realize, I'm a sinner in need of salvation. I have done this thing my way long enough. It has not worked out. I turn to you, Jesus Christ. I believe in you. I commit my life to you. I put my trust in you. And I believe and receive the gift of salvation. Oh, if you do that right where you're at right now, you are born again. You are born again. You're given a new spirit. You're given a spirit of life. Your dead spirit comes to life immediately transferred out of the kingdom of darkness. Do this today. Do not delay. Father, I pray that you would 
Send your spirit on each one of us. Touch us in our area of need. You've spoken to each one of us a certain way. Help us to hear you, to hear your words that were pertinent, special, special for us. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.